We're going to be talking, in fact, actually this will be the unveiling here at Graceland University of a plan. It's called the Global Energy Abundance and Sustainability Plan, or the Genus Plan. The Genus Plan is developed over, I think, probably years and years of research and collaboration, a global effort uh, through uh, networks that I know abroad and here in the United States, university-based, uh, association-based, uh, with coal, with wind, with solar, not so much natural gas, and I'll address, address that in a little bit, uh, but hydrogen and hydraulic fuel cell, and I'm connected with the, uh, the Consortium of Fuel Cell Research through the Department of Energy. Uh, we see about everything there is through the Galvin Center, the REACH program at the Galvin Center for Electricity Innovation at Illinois Institute of Technology. And REACH stands for Renewable Energy Applications for Conserving Humanity. So why, in all logical thinking, would the American Coal Council ask me to present a special presentation at their August uh, annual symposium in Park City, Utah? We'll get into that. One thing I do, and Leon, again, touched on it, if we're going to solve this problem of global climate concerns and air pollution, whether it's here in Las Vegas or Chicago or, or Beijing, we have no luxury to call names. We have no luxury to really create a loggerhead between any energy group. We just don't have that time. We don't have that luxury. So I avoid talking about myself as being an environmentalist or pro-renewable energy, even though my company, Bonnie's and my company, is named Renewable Energy Network for Aggregated and Integrative Services. And I work for a major program called Renewable Energy Applications for Conserving Humanity. But I don't have that much, even though I know the tremendous things that we've heard about all day, with solar and wind and all kinds of different things. I neither have the luxury of saying I'm, I'm, I'm pro-fossil fuels, even though I'm welcome into most of the fossil fuel headquarters and work with Peabody Energy out of, out of, out of St. Louis and, and uh, the American Coal Council and the World, World Coal Association and, and China, the groups there, where 80% of the energy is derived from coal. Um, I am basically a citizen of planet Earth, working hard to form alliances with any and all who are willing to solve the problem of energy poverty and climate issues, atmospheric issues. That's all I am. I don't want to cause any rifts, conflicts, or battles. I just want to solve a problem. The only thing I call myself is I am a, facility, a facilitator of paradigm shift, and that just goes so well with the name of this conference, Changing Paradigms. So, when I talk about breaking through the climate impasse to a real energy paradigm shift for sustainability for people and planet, I am dead serious about that. Uh, I've talked to you about who I am, what I do, but we've got to get the same goal. I don't care if you're in fossil fuels or wind or solar or whatever you're involved in. The goal is to ensure sustainability for all peoples and our planet. This is the greatest challenge, I think, that has ever faced humans in the, all of history. Our goal is to balance the need of eradicating global energy poverty. And we haven't talked about that much today because we've been talking about the United States and we do not generally have energy poverty here. But folks, I'm here to tell you that 70% of the 7 billion people on Earth do face inadequate energy sources or no energy sources. And I think if you take a look at the encyclical from Pope Francis, he talks about that, that there is a difference between south and north hemispheres because it's just that simple. And we're going to be seeing some very sobering statistics along that uh, area. Ending the devastation of energy poverty, this is an Ebola clinic in Sierra Leone. Behind me sits a system that will change the world for African nations, I believe. It's a little two-kilowatt unit that's solar, supported by lithium batteries, 
that can provide one critical aspect, and that is energy to power vaccine refrigeration. 80% of the people who died during the Ebola clinic or the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa was, were not getting vaccine because they could not store the vaccine because there's no electricity for heaven's sakes. This unit is manufactured in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Took us a year and a half to find it. And now we're negotiating with the Sierra Leone government to provide energy to the family of this man who died because he did not have energy. Energy is the source of everything. Food, because you can get irrigation. Education, because you've got lighting and com computer access and telephone access. Building, well-being, and I can document it all up and down the street. When you've got good, reliable energy, you've got standard of living. So devastation of energy poverty in the United Nations, and this will be discussed at the COP21 summit in, in, uh, in, in Paris, we've got to address energy poverty. We cannot no longer afford just to talk about climate issues and atmospheric issues. We've got to talk about the number one thing in the encyclical is the unfairness and the social justice issues about not having energy to those people as as we, we heard from Sarah, those people we should be caring for. So ending the devastation of energy poverty is critical. And look at 3.6 billion people have no or only partial access to electricity. Look at the size of these numbers. This is in millions of people. Millions of people have no electricity. It's in yellow. Look at all of that. And Pope Francis is right. Most of that is in the southern part of the world, not in Europe and not in the United States. And and North America, absolutely not. Then the second challenge, and this is the most difficult thing and the thing that keeps me up at night, how do we balance eradicating energy poverty with combating air pollution for health and the environment? This is the Beijing street, and it does look like that. We've had teams over there where they had to come home early because they were developing lung problems. As concern about lung cancers. So these are the issues. Simple as this. I'm a Midwest person, originally from Nebraska, lived in Wisconsin, Missouri, now in Iowa. We have a, a very great gift here in the Midwest. Look at things as simply as possible and then get her done. Figure out a way and get her done. Don't talk about it anymore. Let's just do it. But to balance energy poverty eradication and air, air uh, combating air and uh, atmospheric problems, really, really critical. Really, really critical. Now, I have some good news for you. We can do this, but it also includes climate change. And we've talked a lot today about climate change and the seriousness for our food sources, our living conditions, rising, uh, uh, rising ocean levels, uh, we do have a problem here, but it's all linked with release of carbon. And I'm going to be talking a lot about, if you're going to villainize something, villainize carbon. Not any one energy source, just can we not take carbon out? I mean, think about it. If you people were in the 60s and 70s, we used to have lead in paint. We used to have lead in gasoline. Now, we didn't close Sherwin-Williams down or ask for their demise or mobile. We simply rolled up our sleeves and got the lead out, literally and figuratively. 